If you were at school in the 80s or early 90s as I was, you might remember something called Econet. Or is it Econet? I'm going to say Econet. Although if you are anything like me, you may not have really understood what it was, beyond something to do with printers and shared programs maybe. Well, the year is 2025 and I've decided that it's time to fully embrace Econet, starting with this video in which I will attempt to provide a short summary of what it is, how it works and what you can do with it. Econet was originally specified by Acorn in 1980 as a low-cost local area network capable of linking together multiple Acorn computers. Its chief purpose was to share resources and information via print and file servers, allowing all machines connected to the network to print documents and access files, without a need for each individual machine to have its own printer, or worse, a very expensive disk interface and a disk drive, the costs of which could easily double the price of your machine. Although it is perhaps best remembered by people like me for its role in linking together BBC Micros in a school computer room, Econet was initially launched in 1981 supporting the Acorn system and the Acorn Atom. When the Beeb went on sale, later in the same year, it actually lacked some of the crucial hardware necessary to support Econet right out of the box. The Beeb's PCB was provisioned for Econet, however, and there was even a pre-cut or perforated hole at the back for the Econet port. But you still needed an Acorn Network filing system ROM slotted into a spare sideways ROM socket, along with various other components to be soldered directly onto the board as part of a paid-for ANB22 upgrade, ideally to be carried out by your friendly local Acorn dealer. As the 80s progressed, Econet support continued to expand to include the BBC Master, which could be upgraded to support Econet via a module that plugged into the PCB without the need for soldering, although it did still require the dedicated ANFS ROM. By the time the Archimedes A300 series was launched, however, the Econet upgrade module alone was sufficient, as the necessary software was now a part of the Arthur operating system, and would continue to be so in later iterations of RISC OS for Econet support on subsequent ARCs and RISC PCs. But what about the humble Acorn Electron? Well, in the UK it was the only post-Atom Acorn 8-bit to be excluded from Econet connectivity, although an Econet daughterboard did exist down under, manufactured by Barson, Acorn's Australian distributor. Putting together an Econet requires a number of different components, some of which are determined by the desired configuration, itself governed by the size of the intended network and the physical space available, along with the proximity of each networked machine. The essentials are 1. Two or more computers, referred to as stations. I mean, Econet is a network after all, so not a lot of use for just one computer. 2. A mains-powered clock box, or a clock circuit, but more on that later, to synchronise signals passing along the network. 3. Some 5-pin DIN network cables. 4. Multiple T-piece connectors or socket boxes. 5. Two terminator boxes to prevent signal reflection. Terminators came in two varieties back in the day, the original Acorn Terminators, which require their own power supply, and the SJ Research variety that work using an innovative plug design. When used in combination with SJ Research's own clock box, these Terminators do not need to be independently powered. The plugs can be attached directly to a socket at either end of the network, or via SJ Research's own Terminator boxes, which were the more tamper-proof option for schools, but which are ultimately just plugs inside a wired-up box. Econet is a bus-type network, with all stations connected by a single cable running from terminator to terminator. This wire has stubs or drop leads running down to each station, but these drop leads are considered short enough in length so as not to introduce any significant reflection of their own. The full length of the Econet wire, however, would produce such reflections without the terminators at either end. Acorn described Econet as a totally democratic system, meaning that all attached stations have equal access to the network. Collisions on the network are avoided by several clever innovations that Acorn built into the system. Each station on the network, before it transmits, will wait until there is a gap, thereby preventing a build-up of network traffic. In the event that two stations see a gap at the same time, and thus start transmitting simultaneously, the Econet interface spots the collision and stops both transmissions. Each of the stations involved will then retry. Econet's collision arbitration algorithm ensures that no two stations go through the same sequence of actions. 
In combination, this allows Econet to function as efficiently as possible with the minimum number of retries. So what does this actually look like once you've strung it all together? The simplest, smallest Econet would have two computers, let's call them A and B, each with their own T-piece connector and network cables. The drop cable of the T-piece connector goes into machine A, with the network cable attaching the left-hand T-piece socket to a terminator and the right-hand connecting to the clock box. For machine B, once again, the drop cable of the T-piece goes into the machine, and the left-hand T-piece socket connects to the clock box, and the right-hand T-piece socket connects to the terminator. In this configuration, the two machines are connected to each other, to both terminators and to the clock box, which completes the network circuit. In fact, very early Econet networks might even have dispensed with the clock box, since the very early Issue 2 and 3 Beebs, as well as the Atom, had clock circuits of their own. These were, however, not especially practical. I mean, what happens if the computer providing that clock circuit gets switched off? Well, the entire Econet gets taken offline. Without the clock box, or indeed without a clock circuit, the network can't function. Acorn therefore recommended the use of a clock box, even if the machines had clock circuitry built in. And to be honest, by the time of the issue 4 beebs, the clock circuitry had been removed from the machines altogether. A more advanced Econet network with multiple machines spread out across a larger space would use socket boxes instead of T-piece connectors. Indeed, T-piece connectors were really only meant for a simple starter Econet to get you up and running quickly. For a proper network of more than a handful of machines that were all sitting next door to each other, you'd need socket boxes, each of which comes with two 5 pinned in sockets, and each computer connects to just one of the two available sockets. The socket boxes are themselves wired to each other, as well as to the two terminator boxes at either end of the network. These terminator boxes have a single 5 pinned in socket to which an individual computer can be connected. So, if we have 8 computers connected over Econet, we would have two terminator boxes and four socket boxes, jointly providing the necessary eight five pinned in sockets as well as two further sockets to connect up the clock box, which Acorn recommended siting in the middle of the Econet network. A single Econet has a ceiling of 254 networked machines, but with the aid of an Econet bridge coming in the shapely form of the classic Acorn cheese wedge unit, you can join Econets together, or bridge them. Technically, Econet will support up to 126 bridges, providing up to 127 networks, giving you a maximum combined total of 32,258 networked acorns. I have absolutely no idea if this was ever achieved in practice back in the day, and I dread to think how well it would have performed, but I like to imagine that somebody somewhere gave it a go. I do know that Felstead School in Essex managed, at its peak, to run 22 bridged Econet networks with approximately 200 machines connected, which is still pretty good going. Do check out Andrew Gordon's fascinating talk about Econet on the ABUG channel if you're interested in hearing more about that, link in the description below. Of course, just connecting machines together over Econet is all well and good, but by itself it doesn't really offer a huge amount of functionality. I mean, it will admittedly permit sending and receiving messages, and the facility to remotely carry out operations on one machine from another, but to get the most out of Econet, you really need a file server. The file server is another station connected to the Econet network, which has the facility to store and share files with other stations. Back in the day, a file server might have been a dedicated piece of kit, such as Acorn's own file store, which came equipped with twin floppy drives and the optional provision for a hard disk. It even had its own clock circuit that you could use in place of a clock box, given there was less risk of the file store being switched off by mistake. Although, in practice, the use of the file store's clock circuit over a dedicated clock box was unlikely to have been used for anything much more than initial setup, considering the complications that said clock circuit could pose, especially if you had more than one file store on your network. Alternatively, you could designate a BBC Micro as your file server, provided said Beeb had a disk controller and was connected to a floppy drive. This is the simplest kind of Beeb-based file server, known as a Level 1. It wasn't very sophisticated, as all it could do was share its floppy drive over the Econet. If you had a 6502 second processor unit, however, you could connect this up to the BBC Micro and operate the Beeb as a Level 2 file server. 
It was still floppy-based, but with a proper hierarchical directory-based filing system with named users and passwords. If you were really lucky and had a hard disk, such as the Winchester, to connect up to your BBC Micro file server, you could run the Beeb as a level 3 file server, with a dramatically larger storage capacity of 40 or even 60 megabytes. Once the Archimedes machines came along, they could act as a level 4 file server, provided they had a hard drive attached. In all cases, the file server had to run special software that allowed it to operate as a level 1, 2, 3 or 4 file server. So how did all this work in practice? Well, consider a classroom setting. A teacher could store Granny's garden on the file server machine, and then every other computer connected via Econet could access and load that software without each of them needing to have their own disk drives and disks containing that software. Instead, one copy of Granny's Garden could exist once on a disk connected to the file server, and all the other machines could access it via Econet. That is, assuming the school had purchased a proper site license, of course, otherwise Formation might have had something to say about it. Likewise, school assignments like essays written in Interword or WordWise could be sent to a shared print server for printing out, and logo programs written by pupils could be saved to the file server, and then the rest of the class could access and run them subject to file permissions. Given the slow performance of tapes, the expense of floppy drives, and the relative affordability of Econet components, this is where Econet really came into its own, not just in schools, but in small to medium-sized businesses as well. The ability to save and load files centrally from a single file server was both hugely beneficial and far more cost-effective than equipping every Beeb with its own disk drive, not to mention umpteen floppy copies of the same software. Econet is still very much alive and well today in retro computing circles. Many choose to run their own home Econet networks using original kit, including not just the early Acorn hardware, but also the compatible SJ Research kit that existed at around the same time. Indeed, it's mostly SJ Research equipment I've been using for this video. Beebmaster of Star.Fame fame is actively producing his own Econet kit as well, including all of the necessary components you need to get up and running on your very own Econet. He recently supplied me with a BBC Micro Econet upgrade kit for soldering into my Beeb, as well as a new set of leads correctly wired to be compatible with Econet. They might look like MIDI cables, but your mileage may vary unless you get the right ones. In short, if you're looking to create and run an Econet that operates just as it would have done in the 1980s, look no further than his website, which includes details on all the items you need. He tells me he's currently considering working on a new batch of clock boxes, so get them while they're hot. The story doesn't end here, however. In my next video, I'll be taking a look at some of the other modern implementations of Econet, including what I like to think of as Econet in a box, and even Econet in the cloud, as well as some of the gaming possibilities. Well, before I go, I'd like to say a big thank you to Ian S. from Stardot for helping me get my facts in order for this video. Econet is a complex topic, and so I very much appreciate him answering all my questions and keeping me on the straight and narrow. I'd also like to thank fellow Stardot member Elliot for providing some excellent photos of both his Acorn and his SJ Research kit. I don't own much original Econet stuff myself, and this video would have been a bit lifeless without it. I'm also very grateful to the freelance artists Thelina Sampath, Julian Thomas and Dima, who put together such excellent diagrams and illustrations. You can find links to their Fiverr portfolios in the video description below. For now though, that's it from me, so until the next time, goodbye!